Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. Um, today we have an ISEV board member who is uh, who is present and he's going to be talking a little bit about his experience um, and then his student is going to present. So I'm going to, uh, to first of all, introduce Juan Manuel Falcon Perez, um, who is um, has, has been working with the ISEV board for quite some time and now has a special capacity uh, in the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles that he's going to tell us about. But um, Juan, thank you so much for joining today and for sharing your, your lab's work with us. Um, I'd like to just uh, first ask you to um, please tell us about how you got into extracellular vesicle research in the first place. Okay, thank you, Ken, for, for this initiative that is uh, great uh, to be here also. In, okay, yes, I, I started with the, with the vesicle in 2006 when I came back from, from Los Angeles, from UCLA that I was doing the, the postdoctoral stage there. And I was working there with the, with the intracellular vesicle. So how the, the vesicle inside the, the cell, they are uh, controlling uh, many aspects of the, of the cells. But when I come back here to, to, to Bilbao, to Spain, they told me that I have to do something very applied. So then uh, at that moment, the exosome started with, with the field and those was vesicles. So, okay, I will continue with the vesicle, but this time in the extracellular space, and that will be more applied to biomarker. And, and since then, I have been working with the, with the vesicles in, here in, in Spain, doing the, the characterization mostly in the hepatocyte, but then in many other areas. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. And, and thanks for your important contributions to the field. I'm, I'm sure that uh, almost everybody on the call is, is, uh, knows your name, at least, uh, if not knowing you in person. And uh, so we really, really appreciate your contributions, one of which has been, you know, to, to help with the International Society um, as a board member. Yeah. And, um, and, and could you tell us about what you've uh, done with, yeah. with ISEV and what you are doing right now? Uh, really was a very positive for me to be in the ISEV. Um, I was first in the education committee, and there I had the opportunity to participate in the preparation of some materials to, 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 dif to, to get a diffusion of the extracellular vesicles and to make easy in, in the clinical and fundamental aspects. The, that part of the education committee was very, very happy and, and I enjoy a lot. And then now, more recently, I with the uh, committee, in, I am co-chairing with Ring Newland, the, the rigor and standardization subcommittee. And our uh, role there is try, try to, to foster the, the, the implementation of tax force in different areas that uh, are good to, to, to help in the standardization of the, of the field of the extracellular vesicle in different uh, liquid biots, liquid biots yes, and also in, in different uh, aspects of the methodology of the extracellular vesicle. And in this, I have to admit that the, the ISEC community is participating a lot. And uh, we have already several uh, task force that are very proactive and they are doing a, a big effort to, to try to, to, to generate uh, material that would be useful for the, for the community. So I think it's a very uh, positive uh, thing that I, 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 I am very happy with that. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. And I think that your leadership there has been very important. And we found out on our call last week that, uh, that there are some people who were not familiar with the different task forces. So I'm going to just put a link in the uh -huh. chat box that people yeah. can take a look at the at what the task forces are um the different ones that that you set up um and they can they can uh, look at that at their leisure but now let's yeah. go ahead and get into the paper that we're going to review today um so i'm just going to ask everybody to please put your comments in the chat box your questions um and then we will get to we will get to unmuting and answering those questions at the end of the presentation so juan could you please introduce um guillermo now yeah. So Guillermo is, uh, I have to admit that, a uh, very talented PhD student, okay, in, the, in my lab. And uh, he joined us in almost two, two years, uh, all, already two years ahead. Um, and he is part of the European ITN Pro EV Life so project. Um, in which uh, 10 uh, postdoc uh, PhD students are participated in this network. 
more, more, more focus in the extracellular vesicle in the can prostate cancer uh, context. Okay. Uh, Guillermo did the, the, the biotechnology uh, in, in the University Autonoma of, of Barcelona. And then he moved to, to do a master in, in Holland, in the Wageningen University. And he did the, the specialization in, in how to fix uh, CO2 by different bacteria. And then he get interested in the extracellular vesicles. And he joined to the lab and he, he was very, very active uh, doing different, different uh, uh, things and one of them was to try to compile all these uh, technologies, uh, single uh, analysis technology for the single vesicle analysis, because our lab has been participated at least with the Raman technology that will be we have been very involved in the development of this Raman technology technology along with uh, Sergei Krulik in Paris, and uh, from that we started this initiative to do this. Uh, this uh, uh, review. So, Guillermo, is uh, now your time to present. You have a place. Okay, yeah, uh, I will share my screen and please let me know if you can see it. Uh, um, Looks great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you, Homa, for this kind introduction. Actually, I was going to present myself, but with this introduction, it's already fine. Thank you. Uh, good evening to everyone, afternoon or morning, because we are in different parts of the world. Uh, well, as Juanma said, uh, my name is Guillermo Danava, and I'm currently conducting the, uh, my PhD in his lab, which is called the Exosomes Lab. And today, I'd like to welcome you all to present uh, this uh, review study that we have done during this last year, in which uh, we study uh, single vesicle technologies that can assess uh, in order to assess uh, extracellular vesicles heterogeneity. Um, now that we know ourselves, I, I would like to uh, start introducing you how uh, single vesicle technologies have changed and participated in uh, the advance of extracellular vesicles research. Um, it has been a long journey uh, in improving our technical abilities since Robert Hooke in uh, 1665 was able to observe uh, the so-called minute bodies uh, in a piece of cork. What he called uh, minute bodies was uh, were actually the what we know now as cells that he was able to visualize using a set of magnifying glasses that uh, we may now think that it's quite archaic, but it was uh, he was able to visualize these uh, cells using these uh, technologies. And the more these uh, techniques have improved, the better we have been able to describe biological processes and also structures. For example, uh, once these kind of microscopes starting being uh, developed, we were able to actually um, describe structures such as mitochondria or even the nuclei. But it was in 1965 when Peter Wolf, uh, in his work uh, that you can see here, the nature and significance of platelet products in human plasma, he was actually able to visualize what he called platelet dust in uh, platelet free blood plasma, and in this case, uh, he was able to visualize them thanks to a, a new technique that uh, was being used by then, that is the ele uh, electron microscopy. On the left picture of the, his paper, you, you can actually visualize a section of platelets from, from, from blood, uh, and you can see the granules inside the, <clears throat> these, these cells. But it's the right picture, the one that is interesting for us, in which uh, uh, we are visualizing actually uh, blood that is freed of platelets. Uh, but here, and, and here we can still see some granules that come from, in, uh, from uh, platelets that have been disrupted or, or any other phenomena. But what we also see are um, a small uh, agglutinates of much smaller particles, which uh, in this case, he, that's what he called the platelet dust. And those are actually vesicles. Uh, that's what he observed, uh, and here's where we find the vesicles, even though he didn't uh, put that name yet. Uh, indeed, what he observed were secreted vesicles that we now uh, have been described uh, extensively. Um, and we, we have been able to see them thanks to this electron microscopy, as I explained. But nowadays, basically, these uh, vesicles are 
uh, well known and they are uh, named as uh, stellar vesicles, as, as we all know. And well, we all know that they are heterogeneous, that they are from uh, a nanometer scale to a micrometer scale. They are bilipid uh, containers and they can contain several um, molecules. Uh, depending on their origin, they can be exosomes, microvesicles, or ap apoptotic bodies. Uh, in this case, they are carriers, as I explained, uh, which can contain lipids, proteins, uh, wide range of uh, different molecules, also DNA, RNA, and they are involved in uh, <clears throat> different roles in biology, which we may include the triggering of intercell intercellular signaling. They also can reprogram met uh, the metabolism of recipient cells, but they can also participate in cellular differentiation, survival and proliferation. They can also uh, help the migration of, uh, of different cells to tissues, as it happens in prostate cancer. Uh, but basically, in fact, the characterization, description of uh, formation pathways, the mechanistics of these uh, extracellular vesicles, the determination of their role in biology, uh, would have not been able uh, without the advance of these technical uh, resources in order to visualize these vesicles or the track reporters that we can use to study their function. For example, the diffusion of uh, the vesicle to plasma, was uh, we were able to visualize it also by electron microscopy, but we can also track them using uh, fluorescence microscopy. Even though bulk and uh, heterogeneous um, ensemble assays have been useful until now, and they can still be useful to study uh, extracellular vesicles, it is important to realize that they can mask the heterogeneity of the structure of the populations, also the composition and the function of vesicles. For example, they may not be able to detect proteins, uh, specific proteins that we may found in, uh, in, the, in the surface of the, of the vesicles. And they can also not be able to track specific molecular states of these proteins that may be useful for, uh, to study the function. So in this case, in order to study the heterogeneity, within these EV populations and subpopulations at the EV level, we need the, 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 the use of new single vesicle approaches, which can be in a set to study the biological function, but also they can be used for, um, uh, can be used potentially as in clinics for the diagnostics and therapeutics. So we compiled uh, more than 20 different uh, new single vesicle techniques However, we have selected uh, the 12 that, that you can observe here, which are the most common, the most common but also the, the ones that have put, uh, a potential use in diagnostics and therapeutics. Some of these methods use uh, labeling techniques such as fluorescence or also nanopart nanoparticle coating, as is the case of uh, this surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. But there are also many that do not use any label. It is important to note that some of these uh, label-free, uh, sorry, here, uh, these label-free techniques, um, sometimes they have a really weak signal, so they can be actually enhanced by using a supporting labeling technique. I, I won't explain all of them in detail right now because it will take an entire uh, other webinar to explain them, but uh, you can actually check all of them in our review in detail. But what, what, they basi uh, what we basically have is an heterogeneous uh, a set of techniques that provide uh, information in the quanti uh, so in the quantification and also uh, the in the size and amount of vesicles but they also provide us uh, an analysis on the um, protein lipid nu nucle or nucleic acids signatures of these vesicles they can measure them in a si in a single eb but then we can have an idea of which populations we have is the example, for instance, of the work uh, performed by Tadischev uh, in 2012. That is when we started working with the Raman spectroscopy, uh, in, in which, so this technique is able to report the biomolecular composition of individual EVs in an heterogeneous sample that can contain several types of uh, uh, extracellular vesicles. These uh, Raman tweezers and microspe uh, microspectroscopy employs a tightly focused beam that can trap uh, vesicles optically or a few of them. And then this same laser, laser is used to um, excite the particle that is uh, trapped there. 
and then we can obtain the Raman scattering that can be further analyzed. This, uh, this uh, Raman scattering is a vibrational fingerprint that it can be studied, and it's what we see here. That's, that's the fingerprint that we observe from the particles. And we, we can actually study different preparations of vesicles and see which, are the, which is the composition of these vesicles. In this case, uh, it was used the, the organism Dectostelium uh, discoideum that, well, you can see it here in the, in the bottom of the, of, the, of the slide, which is basically a convenient general model for eukaryotic EVs. In the graph of the uh, Raman spectra, what we see are uh, optically trapped vesicles that were released from this uh, organism in starvation phases. So what was done was uh, ob uh, obtaining extracellular vesicles at different times of, of the starvation treatment, and they were analyzed. It shows basically that the Raman bands of nucleic uh, acids that you can see here in the 800 uh, uh, centimeters, also the, phenylalan the phenylalanine, the lipids, and the carotenoids are changing upon the treatment. This, uh, this data be, uh, is uh, gathered from single EVs, but then put all together in order to see the different populations that we may have in each single preparation. Um, furthermore, uh, we, we also use the Raman spectroscopy to characterize liposomes and uh, extracellular vesicle preparations from uh, rat hepatocytes and also urine, uh, human urines. In this work, uh, a quantitative method of uh, the, this Raman spectroscopy was utilized to measure the concentration um, of nucleic acids in this single image. On the right picture, what we see actually is a, a cryo cryo electron microscopy uh, picture of this different set of samples that uh, I just mentioned, in which we also see that they have different shapes, but and they also have uh, different uh, inner structures. Uh, but then what we see in the middle picture is the Raman um, spectra of, in this case, three different exosome sets that are prepared from uh, urine samples from different um, <clears throat> in, um, patients. It basically reveals that uh, the composition of the individual vesicles, building up these populations of populations that, that they just mentioned, is different depending on the patients that are in the same group. Uh, regarding, well, I think that they found uh, carotenoids and nucleic acids that were different, uh, that had different signatures. Another example in which we have been involved in that is, is also gathered in this uh, review is the characterization of EVs using the atomic force microscope. Uh, this technique basically uh, exploits the interaction of a probing tip with the sample surface that in this case will be a lot of vesicles that are fixed on a surface. And the deflection and the move of this uh, probing tip uh, causes the inter that the, uh, we can record these inter interaction forces uh, using a laser and a sensor. And then we can actually build up this uh, uh, topography and reconstitute the picture of the sample that we have. Uh, as you can see in this, uh, so in the top picture, we can actually uh, reconstitute 2D pictures, as uh, is in this case the, 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 the picture named B. But then the 3D surface of the sample can also be built up, as you can see in the A. Um, what is interesting of this technique is that instead of using a contact mode, you can use a tapping mode uh, in this uh, atomic force microscopy. And using this mode, we can actually uh, assess the biomechanical pro properties of the surface, such as elasticity, stiffness, and the formability of single ions. Basically, what it does is it taps on the, on the surface, and we obtain a curve like this one that is uh, called indentation curve and it basically it basically shows the three phases or three main stages that uh and uh, as a single vesicle suffers when this uh, proving tip is touching the the, the the vesicle the first one which is here uh is is an is an uh, is, is what we obtain before the contact of the proving tip with the vesicle but then we have a second phase uh, which uh, is during the elastic. I lose my mask. Okay, okay. So <clears throat> uh, this second phase is during the elastic deformation of the 
of the surface, and in this case, the extracellular vesicle, once it touches the, the tip, and then after breaking. Basically, with this indentation curve, we can assess these, uh, last, uh, this, the parameters that I just said, which is the elasticity, stimulus, and, and the formability. And well, in this uh, article, what we found out is that um, the mechanical properties of extracellular vesicles um, between EVs from rats and mouses were different. What we found is that the, the EVs from rats were more fragile than the mouse ones. Um, however, the, the amount of uh, single vesicle techniques is actually increasing. And also the, the, there are existing techniques like these vesicle impact electrochemical cytometry that have a potential use in the extracellular vesicle research. Um, for instance, this, this, um, this vesicle impact electrochemical cy uh, cytometry <clears throat> uh, actually uses the single rupture vesicles whose, contact, uh, whose content is, uh, deli uh, is uh, delivered to, the, to a surface that can detect the change in current due to oxidation of the molecule that is inside the vesicle. Uh, in using this technique, uh, Ewin and their colleagues have been extensively using it to describe the exocytosis of, um, of neurotransmitters, and they, they, they were able to determine which, which one of them play a major role in the exocytosis during synaptic processes. And furthermore, uh, what I would like is to point out the EVQuant assay, which is a new um, microscopy-based assay, which actually is, is now in press, so it's, it hasn't been published yet which is able to quantify extracellular vesicles that are immobilized uh, on a surface. It actually characterizes individual extracellular vesicles in their size distribution, which means that it's a technique which is quite similar or comparable to the NTA, but in this case, uh, it can detect extracellular vesicles as small as uh, 35 nanometers, and also can determine the, uh, the concentration of these vesicles in biofluids without uh, extensive extracellular vesicles isolation, uh, isolation or even purification procedures. It, uh, to, no, to note, I would like to say that also, well, it can ident identify for a fluorescent level markers as the CD9 or CD63, but many other markers can be optimized and used in this thing. Uh, next, what I would like to introduce is an educative example uh, that illustrates the importance or the additional information of the, uh, the importance of the additional information that we obtain thanks to these single vesicle techniques. While we are studying vesicle cell interaction and also the endocytic pathways of these extracellular vesicles. In this figure, what we see is, is three different fusions, fusion or internalization pathways. And the, the three, uh, these three different pathways have been further studied and fully described thanks to these single vesicle techniques. So <clears throat> the, uh, the first one that I would like to mention or explain is, that, uh, is the one that uh, Van Lengerek explained in uh, <clears throat> 2013, in which he developed a system that mirrors uh, the SNR fusion, and he measured it based on, fluores uh, on fluorescence microscopy. In this case, he used actually a really smart um, approach in which what they did was uh, tether um, extracellular vesicles using DNA, DNA hybrids that were anchored on a membrane and also expressed on the extracellular vesicle. Uh, then this, so this uh, DNA hybrid approached the vesicle to the surface and depending on the measured fluorescence, they were able to determine the different stages that, uh, in, the, in the vesicle membrane. Uh, yeah. in, in, the, in the vesicle membrane uh, fusion. What, we found, what they found out is that uh, when these vesicles are close enough to the membrane, uh, the, the fusion of these two bilipid layers occurs spontaneously in a single step. Also, uh, what they, they actually observed that there, there were uh, an heterogeneous uh, amount of uh, fusion pathways, um, and that the hemifusion was also predominating uh, in, in all of these pathways. Um, yeah. Furthermore, the second 
process that, uh, that is in this image um, is the cluster mediated internalization, which has been well studied thanks to uh, fluorescent, uh, fluorescently driven approaches. Uh, in this case, the TIRF is it's been the one that has been more used because the TIRF uh, allows to study the first 100 nanometers of, uh, of, of a, uh, ne next to a bilipid layer. And what they could visualize, uh, thanks to this TIRF, was the uncoating of the clathrin when these vesicles are uh, internalized. In the top picture, which is a, a work developed by uh, my thesis et al. in uh, 2011, uh, they use this TIRF to visualize the endocytic basic, uh, vesicles, vesicle behavior once uh, uh, the vesicles are internalized using this clathrin coating. Prior to scission, these uh, vesicles remain proximal for a, for a huge amount of a long uh, amount of time, proximal to the plasma membrane. But then what, what they see is that after this uh, period of time, that they start moving and doing different patterns. And what they, uh, in, in the study, they present that, they, uh, that they, uh, totally the fully encoding of clathrin is the final stage of the internalization of these vesicles. So then they can actually go to the different organelles to the cell and perform the function. Um, in the bottom picture, they would utilize a more um, unco uh, so an essay that is uh, focused on the uncoating of uh, the vesicle. Uh, in this case, the study visualizes the recruitment of uh, the auxilin and the uh, heat shock protein, no, no, the HSC70 protein, which are essential for the, to develop this uh, clathrin envelope uh, coating. Without this approach, we would have, they wouldn't have been able to determine that these two molecules were necessary to have the, the coating and afterwards the uncoating of the, of the, of the, of the, of the clathrin coating to inter, uh, internalize the vesicles. Um, then, after using this, the, the TIRF to, uh, to, to see the, the molecules that were necessary for the internalization, they also uh, utilized the high-resolution high flow cytometry um, to visualize the different stages that, uh, that, that this internalization may have. And then moving to the last example, um, in this case, uh, Kislin uh, in 2015 utilized also the, a, a TIRF microscopy approach to see, as I said, the, the, the first layer, uh, what, what occurs uh, right on the, on the membrane, and also a FRET assay in order to see which, which, which is the, fu uh, the fusion uh, stages that are used and uh, by the SNR internalization. Um, so in this case, Kislin show in, in this drawing, uh, a single vesicle supported lipid by layer, uh, system that they uh, designed in order to see the internalization. Using this uh, fluorescent uh, lipid probe that is depicted in red, uh, and also a soluble content fluorescent probe that, that is uh, in green, they could actually track the signatures to describe the different stages of a vesicle fusion driven by this SNR mechanism. And furthermore, as you can see below, uh, the in, in the work of, performed by Mati, what they show is a, a picture of the, made by Cryotem, in which you can see that uh, the fusion of these uh, different vesicles, mm, thanks to this SNR system. Um, yeah, and finally, what, what I would like to show is, is that uh, these uh, single vesicle techniques also hold the capacity to discover new and uh, specific and effective biomarkers in extracellular vesicles that they could have been missed using these uh, ensemble methods that I just mentioned in the beginning of the talk. Um, these techniques have the potential to be used in, the, in diagnostics, which is really uh, an outstanding asset for us. And basically in this picture, what we show is a summary 
of, uh, this, of several examples uh, of, bio, of biomarkers that have been discovered thanks to the use of single vesicle techniques. Um, we found out that the four uh, techniques that have been more extensively used are the a PCR, a digital droplet PCR in which uh, uh, the, um, the, the DNA and RNA content of, of each specific uh, vesicle is uh, quantified. Also, uh, fluorescence mark, fluorescent markers uh, that can be detected by high resolution for cytometry. Also, we found out a marker that was discovered thanks to the nanocyte fluorescence tracking. And then mainly the Raman signatures that are really important to determine uh, well the different proteins, lipids, or well biomolecules that we can find in patients or in healthy so in healthy patients or patients that got the disease. If, uh, to mention, I would like to finish up with two examples. Um, the first one that I would like to present is a work that was performed by Park et al in which they used a uh, label-free Raman spectroscopy. In this case, it's a surface enhanced one in which they detect uh, 11 cancer-specific signatures, uh, specifically proteins and lipids, which are able to distinguish EV populations from healthy and lung cancer cells. In this case, the work they perform it in cells. So it, it, this is basically a proof of principle that can be applied uh, in diagnostics of uh, lung cancer in uh, low invasive approaches once it is reproducible using patient samples. Uh, and moreover, another well-known technique, which is the flow, uh, flow cytometry, as I mentioned, has been also used to measure circulating prostate microparticles in plasma from prostate cancer patients. They used these particles in liquid biosphere platforms to identify and characterize patients. And basically, they were able to found, uh, to identify and separate the subjects that had an advanced and aggressive tumor. So in, in Gleason scale, uh, it was above eight, which this means that these are really aggressive and um, advanced prostate cancer can be identified without using the common uh, standardized method, which is measuring the PSA value of, of blood. And well, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And well, any questions that you may have, please, uh, I would like to take them. And well, after all, also, uh, I, would, I would like to acknowledge the uh, Exosomes Lab and Metabolism and Platform for their work. And I would also like to thank you, thank, thanks them to uh, welcome me and help me out with my PhD thesis. Well, thank you so much for the presentation, uh, Guillermo. We're looking forward to a discussion now. And I see that we already have some questions in the chat box. So let's start um, with Susan Goals, who has several questions, um, several good questions. So Susan, why don't you go ahead um, and ask these of Guillermo? Yeah, hi, thank you for the really interesting talk. Um, I'm not a physical biochemist, so I don't understand a lot of these things. But so with Ramon spectrum, Microscopy. How do you how do you define what's in each peak? I it looks like you can get to proteins, lipids, you know, nucleic. It looks like you can look at all the different types of biomolecules in that technique. And how how do you actually define the peaks? Well, uh, thanks for the question, Susan. Um, in in this case, what, what you do it's uh, well, you have your standards. So then you, you can uh, me measure them with the Raman uh, spe uh, spectroscopy. So then this, um, I, I mean, basically, as, uh, I, I would like to show you the, the spectrum because, uh, so here there is one. So basically what, what you define before doing your experiment is where you can find the, nucle the nucleic acids, which in this case are here in the 800. And you define also where do you find your lipids? Because in the end, you have a, a laser beam going to this molecule and it refracts the and, and scatters the light in a, in such a in such a specific way that you always find this molecule in a in, in a specific place so then you can just track back these molecules and you know the amount that you have there and also the different types of lipids they may have a shift but in the in the end you're measuring the shift so that, that, that's why so it's kind of fixed and then you know where you find your molecules and you know whether these lipids have changed and also whether the amount have changed 
So if I may <laughs> jump in and just follow up on that, does does this mean that you that you run are you running standards here, or or is it possible to run a standard to say a purify uh, particular lipid? Yeah, it's, po it's possible to run the, if I can jump. Um, mm -hmm. the, the point is that uh, I am not uh, also, we are not, a, we are a cellular biologist uh, laboratory, okay? So to do this, we associate with the physics, that is Sergei Kruglik from Paris, who has the expertise in all this Raman uh, technology. And so far, what I understood, okay, and this is why my, they, they know that, for example, the tryptophans, how these tryptophans uh, diffract the, the laser, they can know how many, more or less, the abundance of proteins. How they, they have also the 800 band that is more, um, uh, the, the 800 band is the diffraction that the DNA, mostly the one type of DNA, in fact, can make, okay? So at the end, what you have is the, 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 global, the global composition of the, the particle or particle that has been trapped there. And you, what you have is this, this particle has this amount of uh, nucleic acid, this amount of protein, and this amount of lipid. You don't know which lipid is, which, you don't know which uh, protein is. Okay, this is more or less, but at least tell you, you, you have uh, anti the uh, uh, vesicle that are anti for DNA, vesicle that are anti or low, low for protein. That this is the, the message. But yes, the, you can carry, for example, lipids, uh, liposomes, and you can have the specific uh, lipid bands, let's say like that. Also DNA, as uh, the paper that we, has been mentioned by Guillermo, the nanoscale, we compare, the, 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 we quantify by doing the DNA pure, which is the, the Raman signals that you have to expect in, the, in, the, uh, in your vesicle based on the, on the, on the correlation with uh, an, uh, uh, a curve, a standard curve that we made. So it's possible to do, yes, but the, the data came from how the diffraction of the laser and specific bands that you obtain there is the, the peaks. Is is not a, like this, but yes. Thank you. But you need a, you need a physics to do to 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 to, to, to extrapolate all the data. And in fact, it's still working. When we talk with uh, Sergey, that is the specialist, uh, he told us that uh, still many of the of the data is needs to be processed and needs to be analyzed. Is like a spectroscopy is something that, that needs many a lot of software development still. Just to add up something to that, so uh, when I meant standards, it's like you run a standard and then uh, what it's measuring is, as Thomas said, you're measuring specific groups or bi uh, biochemical groups, so you know that they are related to, uh, to uh, one, to one uh, compound or another. So it's not mm -hmm. standards such as, for instance, in, uh, in a chromatography, that you run mm -hmm. the standard and you know exactly where it goes and you have a, a specific time retention for each specific uh, standard. In this case, more like you run standards of lipids that have specific groups that you want to track, and it's what you track back in the Raman spe uh, spectrum. And Susan, before we come back to you, let me just ask um, a question here that has come up in the that's very closely related from PC Espedes, I believe. Um, is the Raman shift additive? Could you, based on the shifts, determine the average composition of specific <laughs> molecules and now breaking it down into things like ceramides or even glyco RNAs is that is that something that you think is possible here? Um, I think you can you can get the protein yes the nucleic acid global composition, but yes and it's additive yes it's additive. In fact, uh, the, the, one of the problem with the Raman is the the the, the limitation the result the sensitivity let's say that you need you can maybe not detect just one molecule one exosome of of uh, you need at least i don't know 10 exosomes of the same more or less composition to see to be able to see as a population it's difficult to 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 carry to the point of uh, with protein which lipids they are working on okay they 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 can tell you what type of lipid uh, but it's something that is still uh, ongoing. So it's the technology that is, still is, is working and, and needs a lot of uh, software, at least software development. 
Sure. So we're probably not going to be able to say that this is, you know, microRNA 21 5P, but yeah. we will be able no, to no. say, you know, there's some RNA here and yeah. here's the overall, yeah. the overall and this, signature. And this has more, more RNA than this one. So this, yes, this kind of information. So it kind of helps you focus on what, which, which biomarker you want to look at by which has the biggest changes by Rama. Yeah, you, you can tell us, yes. So I had one other question, but it's not related to the spectroscopy. Um, and that is when you were talking about rats versus mouse, um, yeah. how do humans compare? How do human EVs compare? Yeah, we, we don't, we, do, we, do, we have not made this comparison. What uh, Guillermo has shown is the comparison of a primary culture, a exosome, a exosome, estrocellular, estrocellular vesicle secreted by rat hepatocytes, primary rat hepatocytes, okay, with a cell line of mouse releasing the, the so are very, very different extracellular vesicle what we were comparing there, okay, primary culture and a established cell line. What we wanted with this uh, work was to show that the 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 the, the value of this the value of this technology the comparison of the of the scanning of I mean of the um, uh, scanning micro uh, electron microscopy I mean no no the scanning the um, sorry I didn't, the, 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 I was, the atomic force microscopy. the atom the atom force microscopy mm -hmm. In our case, in this manuscript, also we compare with lipidomics of these two different um, uh, extracellular vesicles. And we obtain a composition, a different composition of the glycolipids and also the phospholipid in both. And we assume or we extrapolate that the difference in this uh, flexibility and, and elastability was partially due to this composition of lipids. So, but this is the, the extrapolation. We, com we combine two technologies in that uh, manuscript and two diff very different extracellular vesicles as, as models. Okay, But we didn't compare with human so far. But the idea is that it will be different, yes. And in fact, it's not the, the fact that the rat um, are more resistant than the, than the, than the mouse that, because depend on the cells that are secreting these vesicles. Okay, We were comparing primary culture with established cell line in our case, but this is not a straightforward. We also have the question here from Nadim uh, Tawil. Who, uh, Nadim, feel free to, um, to elaborate on this um, too, but um, Nadim is asking, could you elaborate what does the more fragile characterization entail? So, so what, is, what does that experiment actually look like? And then the, you know, the, the data that comes out of it. But the, the, I mean the one of the, the the one of the atomic force. So this one that we were commenting right now. So in in the end, what you're com you're comparing the the, the indentation curves. Um, I, I didn't do it. Actually, it was Felix uh, the one that did it. But in the end, you you are you are taking the. Well, I don't know if you see the the pointer of my mouse, but in the end, you are actually uh, measuring and comparing this uh, section two, in which you you see the, the this. Uh, this increase in the in, in the force that the extracellular vesicle can hold or, or can manage, and in the end you're comparing them, and you know which one is more elastic or it breaks out uh, faster. So then that's why you can know whether they are fragile or not. So I'm you're sorry, basically seeing the bubble popping. Yeah, okay. kind of. Well, actually, you're not seeing it, but yeah, <laughs> you're you're sensing it. You're sensing. You're, you're yeah, sensing it. exactly. Yeah. Yes, one of the problems of this technology is that you need a, a lot of vesicles to do that. I mean, to do a, a statistics. And this one, this is one of the the, the, the issues with the, with this manuscript that the, we don't have the time is limited. So we to 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 run this experiment. But this is important to know that this technology is very powerful, but you need to do uh, a lot of uh, these vesicles in order at the end can tell you also a subpopulation of, of different type of vesicles that you have in your preparation, but require a lot of time to, 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 to do a, 
a good subpopulation characterization of this. But the good thing about this technology is that that mm. can tell you that these vesicles are more resistant than the others, and this gives you clue about how they are going to cross biological uh, barriers, for example, or how they are going to to fuse <coughs> or, or to interact with other biological membranes. So this is important information. Yeah, but do you think they would fuse more easily if they're more or less I elastic? How do you think it would go? I think it will be more easily if they are more fragile to, to, to do the fusion. Yeah. But this is something to test also. I don't know uh, if somebody has tested that. That the fragility is uh, with the fusion will, will be more easy to do it. Yeah, thanks for that question, Nadim. Yeah. Did, did that, does that answer your question or did you have yeah. a follow up? Yeah, no, that's exactly it. I was wondering whether any biological differential has been uh, seen already. Uh, as a consequence of this differential in uh, extracellular vesicle fragility. But I guess you just answered that question. <laughs> so that's great. You. That's great. Okay. Yeah. And it, um, it, it is a fascinating question. Um, you know, the biological implications of, you know, of these physical properties, what's this going to mean? And like, like Juan yeah. says, it could, it could have something to do with uh, getting across barriers or exactly. fusion. So it does um, just to get a better idea of what, what you mean when you say time, um, so if, if you're doing this, if, if you're sitting there at the instrument, what kind of time are we talking about to, me to measure, you know, 20 vesicles or 100? More or less, each particle, each, part each, each particle will require allow between 30 and one hour if you have good setup. But I have to admit also that this atom force that we have used is not last, last uh, equipment. Okay, it's, now you have uh, atom force microscopies that are very, very fast in, in taking the, 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 the records. So, but in our case, the one that we have here was an old one, um, is what we, we took. But I think it's a technology that is uh, in, implementing very, very, very fast. It's the new equipment and, and with this idea of doing very quick and, and very resolutive is, uh, with this atom force microscopy. So, so the point here is that I don't know how many, uh, so the time to measure one vesicle, but the point is that it takes a lot of time until you get uh, all, the info, all the information and the sensing for one image. So every single image that you take takes a lot of time. Like I guess it's minutes. So. This is a very naive question, but um, uh, yeah. can you easily differentiate between uh, extracellular vesicles and uh, lipoprotein of same size with atomic force microscopy? You could, you could easily, I don't know, but uh, it's, a, it's, just, it's one, one thing to, you need to carry the, the standards, you need to put the, the in parallel, the sample with you, uh, with lipoprotein by pure, let's say, and you can see how this, the behavior of the, in, in the atom for microscopy of the, of the lipoprotein, but yes, in theory, you can. Okay, so we have a question here that we skipped over from Elena Zaccaroni. Elena, please go ahead. Yes, thank you for, for the nice talk. I was um, quite interested in the last example that you showed on the use of um, single EVs technologies for the discovery of biomarkers. Um, I see the importance of going deep into the single levy characterization, but I was also wondering, um, do you think, or do you have any experience like, uh, too deep of a characterization of EVs and the extreme heterogeneity among EVs, even in the from, from the same patient individual, might actually impact their uh, importance and their significance as um, circulating biomarkers, for instance, for cancer diagnosis. I mean, if EVs among them are so heterogeneous, for instance, in terms of uh, EV markers, um, how can you? I mean, do you think it could impact the differentiation between a cancer patient and a healthy control uh, based on the markers of the extracellular vesicles? I, I, I indeed think that it, that may happen because if you are able to um, categorize the heterogeneous EV population that you have in different subpopulations and you find out that one subpopulation carry a biomarker that you can now detect because you are able to isolate this subpopulation, this may make you distinguish between two types of patients. 
because sometimes the problem is that you have a biomarker which is not uh, in a enough amount in an enough amount in order to measure it. So if you, if you are measuring all the biomolecules that you have in your sample preparation, and this one that it could be your biomarker is hidden or masked by the rest, you may not be able to find the biomarker that is good for you. So if you may be able to distinguish between some populations, maybe you can then carry out a protocol to just isolate these uh, vesicles and use the biomarker that these vesicles carry to distinguish among patients. That, 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 that may be my theoretical answer, but I don't really have uh, expertise yet to really know that these techniques are... So these techniques have the potential to do that, but I, I think that we are not yet in the point, but we are, we're reaching it. I had one, I was really interested in that uh, prostate. Uh, I just didn't quite write down the reference for the, for the prostate cancer marker. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, sorry, sorry that I missed uh, missed that. That's okay. So if you could send that, that would be great. Or I can, if you go back to the second to the last slide, I could write it down. We have, um, yeah, uh, Guillermo, do you want to just so? And and now we, we do have one more uh, one more question here, um, or actually a, a comment, I guess. Yeah. So my group works on we develop um, nonlinear uh, optical microscopy systems, and so we found recently we could see extracellular vesicles in our images. So we've been starting to characterize those, you know, with the high resolution of nonlinear optical microscopy, um, we can resolve single EV. So we've been trying to work towards, you know, contributing, but we're, we're focused on our experience is more in like building the technology in the microscope. So it's, it's very cool to see um, what other people have developed and what problems we can try to solve with our technology. Very interesting. Well, thanks for sharing that. And we will conclude this session. Um, thanks, Guillermo. We're, we're going to look, look for some really great work coming out of, uh, out of your hands again one of these days. Um, so good luck to you. And uh, thanks, Juan, for uh, sharing today and uh, for, for your leadership on the Rigor and Standardization Subcommittee. Um, and I encourage everybody, go ahead and take a look at those task forces, see if there's some place where you would uh, possibly like to get involved. So, um, so, so thank you all for joining today. I hope you have a okay. great rest of the week and, um, and we'll see you again sometime soon. Take care now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us.